Okay, hello everyone, welcome to today's episode. <clears throat> I feel um, uh, my own absence from the pattern of these talks may be coming soon. And I felt for this episode, I speak about, about how sight is a double-edged sword and what that means. Human beings have different strategies to life. I am one human being. I am one person uh, who is looking at the world in the manner I'm going to speak. Life starts, or the way I experienced it, started off as being an outer realm focus. That means before I had the notion of an inner realm and an outer realm, there was just an activity. There was as if one program, one sort of program to follow. Upon noticing that what I see is not only me, It's like a human being wondering <clears throat> if, there's, if their eyes are double-edged, double-sided. And it's a very strange question. But the mind cannot be ignored anymore. In front of our eyes, we have, until we find some sort of immortal technology, or in the future there is a juice, let's call it immortal juice, people drink this and they don't die. In the outer realms, the sight requires (coughs) survival, the sight requires expression of what is surviving that means as if you uh, built a house you survived but now in some sense you need to live in the house right so once the house is done you live in it <clears throat> and so the outer realm site once it is it is done I feel the inner life begins for me the way the inner life began was in the outer realms I felt suffocated I felt a sort of karmic quarantine. I felt like Midas, but everything I felt I was touching was not, you know, it felt like, um, my, uh, poetically, my, uh, uh, soul felt it was a museum and the mind was, uh, not to be touched. Think of it this way, that um, a child cannot use a knife and a fork at a young age. The child doesn't know what to do. Do you know? So the child is given like a spoon. But then once it has the ability, the the discretion, the discrimination to know how to use it, then in some sense the child can be given a knife. right? And I feel up to the year 2011, specifically in my own life, I was not allowed. I felt I was there was an, an, an authorization of my inner realms to express in the outer. So what I'm trying to say is as a human being, our sight is not one-sided, yet we are living as if it's one-sided. <clears throat> We're living as if the sight is what is observed, not the observer. So the double-edged sword is that every moment of sight requires an observed and an observer. Now, if the observed is defined by form, the observer must be separate from the form. That means think about it this way. If right now I was looking at a tree, um, I am outside of a tree looking at the tree. If my attention was inside the tree bark, 
right? I would not be able to know that I, th there's a tree here, right? And it's kind of like our first person outer realm perspective conditions us not to wonder about how the mind's life is space, is, is like being. You know, my body has done things. My mind has just been being. As far as I'm concerned, our minds are... <clears throat> our brains are um, uh, uh, biomechanical processors, you know? <laughs> but what the brain is doing is not the doer. And I feel this is the most important insight. That we were objects, we became <clears throat> subjects to ourselves. The subject we use for us, for who we are, is like the mind. And the, we can only use this because the after brains emerged, we considered human beings. I was under the impression when I was young that I knew nothing. Like tabula rasa, it's like a blank slate. <clears throat> and then the known is being added. Then there is some, so there's nothing to see at first. The child is just born. It's not even conscious of itself. Then there is something to see. Then as a response to this, what is seen, we are wondering about the other, right? So we see reality first. Then we say there's imagination, you know. <clears throat> That means before we get to the point that we can even consider what is physics and metaphysics, we need to have physics. It's as if we have two eyes. We are one being, but two types of being in one being. Just like we have two eyes that see the same. This is a very big clue. Our, our biological eyes, we have a left eye, right eye. You close the right eye, you only see with the left eye. You close with the left eye, you only see with the right eye. And if you have only one eye open, you lose your balance. <clears throat> that means someone running with one, one eye or someone being the goalkeeper of a soccer game um, and having an eye patch. Imagine a pirate was made to be a goalkeeper for a World Cup match, right? That pi pirate could not coordinate, you know? or through years of adjustment may be able to coordinate. But the idea is that if we just uh, keep a, have a blind eye to uh, uh, the observer, we will just be an object. We can't balance. We can't properly coordinate in this multidimensional uh, world of ours. And if we just have a blind eye to the matter, we cannot coordinate. These two eyes require to be open. And this is the unique thing. We have this view that the, th uh, I mean, different traditions have uh, animated it. Some people see the pineal gland as the third eye. You know, for me, there is no such thing as a third eye. <clears throat> Even though I have felt unique pressures at, at my forehead d during different times of speech. But I'm telling you, there is no third eye. The third eye is what is keeping all of it. So it's as if we require to use our two eyes. And once these two eyes are no longer at war, once du dualism is not wrong, <clears throat> once chaos and order stop um, cherry picking hate and love, The third eye is how consciousness is the space of all sight. That means I will say, we have never been just objects. We have never been subjects. We have been the potential that has animated somehow. You know, the, uh, this morning, actually, I was listening to one of my own talks from years ago. And I was looking to see my own blind spots when I give these talks. 
because the, there's this quote that says to be human is to earn. That means as long as we are human, mechanical perfection is an unnecessary expectation. <clears throat> but I was kind of listening to see what kind of picture in each episode I'm painting. And I noticed something. I noticed that we will not know freedom until we become lions. That is the truth. Unless the lion, unlike the, <clears throat> the lioness, unlike the coyote, doesn't eat whatever is in front of it. And I feel perhaps this is the difference between the traditional view of the young soul and the old soul. You know, naivety, whether in multidimensionality or in a singular dimension. The naive have their own lessons. You know, I will, I will be honest, this world um, has karmic lessons for those who uh, take unnecessarily and it has also karmic lessons from those who forget to at all engage. The blind spot that I noticed in my own talks was that I was hearing one person speak. And so this is the main challenge, that language is based on the dividing and conquering of one a sort of specific state of existence, <clears throat> but what we are surpasses that. And you know, it's, it's as if like, uh, I'll tell you, I've had moments where I have spoken to nature. <clears throat> you might not believe it, I've actually... Uh, just once I tried it out, <laughs> there was um, <clears throat> a friend of mine had a dog, and it wasn't his dog, it was his neighbor's, um, the neighbor had gone, and I was uh, <laughs> with my friend Gabby at the time, and there was this kind of like hot dog dog in the room, <clears throat> and <clears throat> <clears throat> this um, dog would just keep barking. And for a moment, I decided to entertain this view that, all right, we're creatures that communicate. Communication is not a physical phenomena, do you know? And it could be that when a person, for example, says, hi, right, even though that's a sound, even though the letters the may evoke in the inner realms of the person, but it's also an intent of some energetic expression. <clears throat> and I remember I sang a poem for a dog. <laughs> and I felt at the end the dog was like barking for me to stay, but I could have been wrong, you know. But there was something that for a moment I felt like, who am I kidding here? Every moment the person can have an ideological archetype to entertain. Any moment you can in your inner realms feel like a king or feel like a peasant. Right? So it, there has to be more than just identifying which the outer realms conditions us to. You know, <clears throat> and it's very strange. On one view, I feel like, is it man's business to care about what happens to man? Because usually, uh, if you are raised in um, <clears throat> an uh, ideological environment where faith is around, that means you trust the world before looking at it. That's what faith means. Trust before sight. Because if you see something, then it's not faith, and an analysis begins. But if you don't see anything, it has to be faith. So you can say faith is like invisible, it's the only route to trusting invisible intelligence. I don't know how other way it can happen. It's like that person <clears throat> who rode a motorcycle, the motorcycle was physical, 
right? Their body, their biological body was physical, but the maneuverance of the motorcycle, how the motorcycle was maneuvered and how the ability to maneuver the motorcycle came about was not a physical phenomenon, right? We are, we, it's very poetic because in some way we are a non-physical space maintaining the physicality. You, a person can uh, uh, argue that yes, there's a brain and only because of this brain there is consciousness. You know, we can choose to say that it is um, our, our psychologies, who we've been speaking to you right now is a hallucination of neural activity. Sure, <clears throat> we can have that idea. But the question then comes, where does the know-how to move come from, right? And that is not coming from just a physical scenery. It is not just coming from the brain. The brain is an antenna. This is the only statement I have found that I feel it will get through to the ear of secular audiences. Because we have pushed out the idea of higher intelligence. We have pushed out the idea of abstraction and human identity. Do you know? <clears throat> that means there is science fiction has a good advantage, but its biggest disadvantage is that it stops the reality of the situation coming about. That means imagine people are like, oh man, you know, cyberspace worlds, get out of here. That's imagine, that's our imagination. You know, that's not going to happen. You know? <laughs> but what do you know? It happens. That's the thing about nature. It has, it seems like it has no, ver there is no verbal obligation for it to explain itself. <clears throat> You know, sometimes in, from the Vedic standpoint, there's this view that a being has access to a universal witness. That means even though you're a biological human being right now, your presence as an energy and attention being instantaneous is universal. So think of it this way. Your body is planetary. Your mind is universal. Your soul is beyond conception. It's inconceivable. I feel this is accurate. And I'm just one, one random dude just talking about this. But I'll tell you, I feel this is the clue. The inconceivability of how our intelligence, think about it this way. What is the most advanced movement that could occur on this planet? It's like, let's say you on the outer realms, you see someone do parkour. You know, you, you see someone with a motorcycle do backflips. <clears throat> you see, I don't know, someone dancing while skydiving. Those are complex outer realm uh, mobility. Uh, uh, mo uh, 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 mobile behavior, you know, it's like the outer realms, it's movement oriented. That means it's like, it's like, even if the person doesn't know what they need to do, the purpose of the outer realms is to move something. <laughs> something has to move. Your stomach gives you your purpose if you get hungry. If you get thirsty, that thirst becomes your purpose, right? So in the outer realms, there isn't actually too much analysis. A person can really live simply and their biological existence and their mind sphere, the space of that they're aware of how they're aware of the outer realms can suffice <clears throat> but to live as a mind means to either be multi-local or non-local i feel the ego has an evolutionary step before the solution that means a person can choose to nullify the moment in in just considering it's all one presence in many moments where I've gotten upset, sad, that's where I was like, okay, time for oneness. Because if I if I maintain in that dual, stay in that dualistic room, I know I will get angry. You see, it's 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 about you being able to step out of uh, the inner room before you move in the outer room. If you are still in a specific inner room, then the outer room, outer realms get tainted by this by the type of. ideological relativity, I don't know how else to say it. That means if there was someone in front of me and they were starting to fight, <clears throat> and uh, if I don't get out of my inner realm before the conversation, before the fight, or as soon as possible, then I will engage the fight. Do you know? So there is something about a person being able to change their mind before their body. 
we see it in <clears throat> martial arts. There's that martial arts master who like 12 opponents come and then somehow it's as if not only the martial artist is lucky, not only the karma of the moment is with him, not only the lords of karma uh, have backed him up. It's also that the person in their inner realms... has freed the world from itself, it may be hard to hear. <clears throat> we have this view of freeing our mind from the world, but we don't have this view that we need to free ourselves from the world. It's a choice. It's as if does the world get to live simply, or does the world get to live gently, or, or, or the way it wants, or do we get to live the way we want? And if everybody is just born and lives the way they want, even though that is the right strategy, because it's, there's some um, um, overwhelming <clears throat> uh, avalanches of information that happens when a person actually starts trying to see how nature is as it is. And that avalanche of info information is the reverse engineering of however way you have unfolded your psyche to the moment. I feel um, there was a uh, mistake I made, and it wasn't <clears throat> uh, to others, it was to myself a mistake I made. <clears throat> and I felt like this mistake maybe should be shared. And it's that sometimes when you go towards the inner realms, and when you live as a mind, if there is not the follow-up, the person, it's like mental activity evaporates. To live as a mind can make the person timelessly dismiss the body. <clears throat> to live as a body may make them trapped in time. That means either way there is a suffering, but I really hope the future advanced communicators find a way out of it. Because I know that for me, I couldn't. And not that I couldn't, it, it's just, it doesn't, the, we, it's, the civilization is too objective focused. That means it's as if like, <clears throat> telling a, uh, It's like the world is at a level of a child that wants to go and play in recess, but that child is being told to, for example, be a teacher, do you know? You see, the, the younger I feel the mindset, the more justification there is to take. That means sometimes when I see violence, like you see videos on YouTube of violent people, it's as if a dimension of their psyche never grew. It's as if their mind is lost in a fragment of, of a time they existed. An advanced civilization <clears throat> must focus on, that means if I was to say the most important technologies for the next 500 years, outer realm technologies only in the medical practices. That means I would, if AI is used in <clears throat> medical sciences, like here's the thing, technology
the body should reach a capacity where we can live instead of hundred years, thousands of years, and by mere choice we can exit the biological experience. This would be advancements in the outer realms. Advancements for the inner realms would be to make them more instantaneous. Right now, I have to speak my mind. I have to write down my ideas. Do you know? But this is going to become way more instantaneous. So we can say that the technologies we can expect in the future are going to be the body enduring longer and the need for voices and speech to be transcended. You see, the moment we can, if I, what I'm saying could instantly be part of your mind consciously, it, speech becomes obsolete. That means it could be totally possible that our species becomes a silent, super information species, hyper speed of information. The, the world we're building is not designed for human beings, but it is designed for humanity's mind. It could be that we started, you know, how Drake says, Drake says we started from the bottom, now we're here, you know, and evolutionary scientists say we started from the bottom of the ocean and now we're here. <laughs> I will say we started at the bottom of individual consciousness and now we are the here. We are becoming it. We should not fear the fluctuation of the biological existence. We should not fear the body. The body is an instrument. That means the same amount of fear that should be given to the body is the same amount of a violinist who's ha held the violin in its, hand, in its hands from the beginning of life and then has to put down this violin and leave the room. So in some sense, the body is here for the great performance of the energetic ability of space to become matter. You know, <clears throat> it could be that space is the mind of matter. And if space is our mind, then our minds, our voices are unique. That means we are, we are in a puppet show. It's as if energy is puppeteering uh, individual human beings in the illusion of continuity. But this is, this is going to be, this is honestly the biggest philosophical concern. Because after <clears throat> um, uh, Darwin's great work, Survival is the aim. Everybody knows. But when it comes to the mind, what if the body needs to survive? What if the mind needs to perform? What if the mind had to participate? And what does it mean to live as a voice when you have a body? It is a strange time because time is cracking. like a sky of another world. I have noticed that if one doesn't learn or doesn't have an inkling, an intuitive inkling, that unless they love their being, their greatest work cannot arise. A person can wait outside of a door they pulled and it did not open to after eons realize they just had to push it open. And so those pulled by divinity and those pushed by their animal minds, the great uh, performance of the species is coming. That means for the first time, it is not enough to be a human being, you have to be your humanity. And so I feel Advaita, Zen, non-duality and the emptiness in Buddhism. They are the preparation. They are the preparation for a species <clears throat> learning more and more.
that the mind departs from the body to realize it can never depart <clears throat> as existence you know i feel sometimes i'm like okay so what is it is my is my existence my karma or is it the universe's karma i can't tell you know <clears throat> i can't tell if what's happening to me is because what's it's the karma of the planet you know <laughs> Or it's the karma of an individual on a planet. We see it in movies, like there's some movies or music videos where the world's about to end and a meteor's about to hit Earth. <clears throat> and imagine you're someone who's like a, has been a student of life, it's learning, 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 learning. Then you're like, what the? Like it's as if it's all gonna end. You have learned and you have not expressed. It's incredible. We know how fragile the human being is, but the educational system has not designed itself in a way where the work of that student can serve the collective. You know how many teachers have thrown away. It should be a crime. I feel <clears throat> that teachers who in some sense an, an educational system that makes children use paper to fill assignments where the teacher has to throw away the paper at the end or archive it in somewhere nobody's ever going to see. You see, it, the first thing the educational system needs to do is to have a global value system trickle down in all its dimensions. That means there should literally be someone in every university going to every department and be like, report your progress, you know, and shout at them like, like the military. And that way, everybody's going to be on their toes. And the whole effort of uh, uh, education will be not to just teach. That's disgusting to just, just teach, you know. <clears throat> the point is everyone is an explorer. If people do not become explorers, then our species has learned nothing. If people just repeat past algorithms and they don't innovate new algorithms, then it's as if we, there's nothing we have learned. It has been a waste of paper. That means universities shouldn't have the name universities if they don't have universal pr perspectives on reality. I'm telling you, people have egos, institutions have egos, nations have egos. It is only the planets like, hey, guys, I'm one being. Chill out. You know, and we're like, no, we're going to fight over resources, over our own self-declared paint on the surface of the sphere. Regardless, though, I feel... Uh, Love is the keyhole and trusting the unknown and all dimensions of your experience like a stranded away multidimensional being. You know, even though we are social creatures, we live in society, you know, it's like that moment where I'm pretty sure most people, many people have experienced this, where they have a friend Excuse me. <clears throat> Where the friend is upset and you as a friend go and try to change their mind. You'll be like, hey man, don't worry, that was a mistake. <clears throat> it's okay, you know, but the person's like, no, you know, I'm weak or da 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 da. Right? So it's like in that moment where the person is not upset and sad about like it's not that the person doesn't hear the goodwill the person is sad about themselves you know we don't get sad just about what others do you know it's also our own performance which is in in in, in the spotlight of 
our, our own mind's eye. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, the mind is higher dimensional technology. That means I wouldn't be surprised if we have advanced, um, uh, <clears throat> um, I don't know, technologies in the future that could totally see subtler dimensions around us. And we would notice there is literally instruments. What, what appears to people, I, I'm telling you, as in, in back in the day, they would say guardian angels. In some sense, they would say spirit guides, interdimensional forces, the invisible other, uh, the list goes on. What that was is I feel the technology of a higher dimension. We are, it's not that there is <clears throat> extraterrestrials. It's that we are the extra perceiver in this dimension. That means we have made a big deal, and it's because it's a reaction to emptiness. It's like, is happiness worth it if it lies to itself? certain mystical schools of thought they have this view not that the person can go out of body that concept doesn't exist the body is in the mind instead of the mind being local to the body the body is local to the mind the body has a location because of the mind's presence that's I would say pure mysticism that's pure fearlessness as long as there's something to lose and you want to hold on to it, you it's pretty much like a <clears throat> a defeat. You know? It's like a person um, praying for a candle not to melt, but instead of realizing something should have been done with the light of that candle, you know? And I would say we have to start with simple purposes to our life and then build up to complex so the moment they're complex so what does that mean we have to create a system where <clears throat> failure doesn't exist there is just uh, layers of efficient systems being built and any system that goes into inefficiency it falls back so that means we create a system that is defensive uh, <clears throat> excuse me that is uh, uh, has offense first and then as a backup has defense right sword and shield kind of technique and system imagine right a, a system that is using the sword but anytime the sword can't be used or if it's like taking a break or whatever the shield is there <clears throat> so if we if we could imagine build a, a lot of dimensions and this is not even in the outer realms per se people can like <clears throat> like i can't move like um an iron beam they use to build buildings with my hands but in my mind I can envision it hovering and coming and standing wherever I want <clears throat> you know it's like a person can practice their inner realms by just looking at an object and multi localizing it in their inner realms and then discriminating which one is the real one Systems that implement this sword and shield layer, this sword and shield layering, it would mean that anything that can't defend itself falls into the defense of the previous simpler system. So we should build a civilization that has endless backup systems. <clears throat> People who make backup systems on this planet for the species in any way should get paid the highest amount. I don't care. <clears throat> Even if you're a, a movie actor, you know, or, or a, f a footballer or whatever. It's like there is honor in those who hold the shield for the species. And there's honors for also those who go to the front lines of the species. <clears throat> 
in certain moments of my life I've had the strength to go to the front lines that means I've been in a moment and suddenly something's been wrong something intense some intuitive force suddenly pulling my attention in the moment and then it's like instantaneous you got to do something you know what it is it's like the moment you see something your inner realms have actually also done something but out of all the probabilities of the different things you can do you have to choose <clears throat> and when we learn we're rhythmic entities the choice that you trust the most gives you rhythmic intelligence trust gives you rhythm that means think about it you got to just you know hit your foot to the beat and then you're suddenly part of it right and so we can say those who trust in the universal the universally alive let me tell you God is waiting, from a mystical sense, God is waiting for himself <clears throat> in man. Something I wanted to dedicate a special episode to, but I guess I'll just bring it up, the idea here now, it's so vivid to me. <clears throat> I had a um, experience through the logos now what the logos is um you see for example the word biology and everything that has logi at the end of it the logos was the inner guiding wo voice it was the planet's communication it was a direct line from planetary fields to uh, the invisible office that every being has. You know, it's phenomenal. The person realizes, a young child realizes they have a hand and the child then can use the hand. So what you realize, you can use. The logos. Poetically shared with me in the inner realms. that once a human being attains simplicity they begin learning from the movement of superior dimensions any moment you're comfortable with the room you're in you see beyond that room reason tackles discomfort discomfort ultimately is an emotion that means when we even wonder how how is a creature reasonable it's the it's like the information from the environment like waves hitting it and then they it, it being as a retaliation but through the moment, energy of what is hit it <clears throat> that means if somebody speaks to you angry it's so easy to speak with the same energy they have you could literally throw back the energy they're giving back at you you know <clears throat> In Aikido, they would even use that energy to throw the opponent down. That means in Aikido, the person's like, oh, this opponent is using this much energy to attack me. I'll just direct the opponent somewhere where his attack hits the ground. Like Aikido, honestly, is one of the most hilarious fighting styles. It's pretty much when somebody runs at you, you just turn. And <laughs> <clears throat> By turning, you, you shift their, the way their energy is directed. The idea was that God enters the body of man. And this God is not an idea. It is not a game. 
it is a realization of a self before a self and that's why in yoga and mysticism they called it self inquiry <clears throat> that means think of it this way um, it doesn't matter if the person is whatever religion they are okay the person let's say you're a religious person let's look from a theological lens so the religious person is like okay there's truth in this I'm gonna check this truth this truth is a message this revelation is a message and this message was for me and I need to understand this message now check this out how well you understand the message has to do with how well you understand the self that is interpre interpreting the meaning of the words so that means if you don't study yourself the message is limited so self inquiry is more important than information being uh, interpreted because the information being interpreted is limited to that self so it's like this imagine there was this command to the species like hey everybody put a pause like a video game on your ideological system how you understand truth is limited to how you understand yourself that is processing that truth so if we do not explore the self we are limited in how we receive think of it this way why is it that a young child let's say a newborn infant you give them a holy book the newborn infants like like can't even like hold the book <clears throat> right so then the child goes and learns language when the child learns language the language translates becomes a film so I don't know how people are reading on this planet but um, when I was younger, I, I, I did, I had, it wasn't that I struggled with reading, it was boring. Reading was so boring for me because I wouldn't see images to the words. But if you read fast, you're actually reading a film. You're seeing a film in your inner realms. <clears throat> so I would, I, I would tell you, I feel it's also the case. If I, if I, when I speak fast, I feel the film animates quicker. The great question comes, <clears throat> is nature our choice or are we nature's choice? And imagine this was asked from the past, present and the future. The present had no opinion. The past denied. The future accepted. The advanced civilization, because fear is not in its algorithm, will just see the information, then uh, storify it. When a person becomes selfless, let's say you learn from your individual self then do through selflessness and Advaita you learn from your collective self <clears throat> after you have learned from your collective self you cannot be the same individual so you cannot even have the same problems that means there's something ha hilarious that happens I think in mysticism that the person who has problems who's trying to find a way out at some point the person who has the personality with the problem fades before there's an answer it's as if the person's like I have a problem uh, <laughs> the person's like I have a problem and let me go find the solution in my outer realms and the outer realms is so vast imagine there was a problem its solution was in the Andromeda galaxy we're like oh my god too far you know <clears throat> But you can also solve problems by wondering who has this problem. Just that question is so powerful. I feel that question wakes up people from whatever inner realm lockdown they're in. Inner realm ideological lockdown. <clears throat> because to be free doesn't mean to choose. 
the thing about free will is that the moment you choose, you're not free anymore. You're defined. So it's as if we have this illusion, man is free, yet the, our decisions deny us from the freedom of the other side. Your outer realms require to be used like a sword in the sense that effort has to push the biological body to its next phase. <clears throat> but in the inner realms, the effort, because it's non-local behind your eyes, how we are a subject to ourself, like most people, if you, okay, here, I'll, I'll tell you an example. Let's say you had a group of people, 10 people in a room, <clears throat> and there was, this was, let's say, a, a sort of kind of, uh, uh, psychology social experiment okay we would see those 10 people in the room imagine having to speak like let, this, this is something that I feel uh, as, uh, okay I'll just say so 10 people in a room we leave the 10 people there and they have all the resources and they're not going to fight over resources let's say you give them infinite resources okay people in the room are not like starving where they have to kill each other and it messed up like how films are yeah. <laughs> so it, imagine it's like all the people in this room have resources and they have to live in in this kind of like let's say um half sphere even um garden like world okay now whatever some room <laughs> so these 10 people what's going to happen to their psychologies they each come from different walks in life they each have different behaviors what's going to happen is that when you put 10 inner realms that have their own <clears throat> centrism you know ethnocentrism and whatnot in a room right and it's it becomes more complex um, um so let's say there's um Oh my God, this is becoming so difficult, <laughs> this metaphor. Um, imagine starfish, which they don't have a gender. I mean, this, this can't work. <laughs> the metaphor has two variables, too many variables in it that deny the metaphor's validity, but I'll share the metaphor. <clears throat> I was thinking, imagine 10 people are in a room and what happens to their inner realms, right? Their inner realms will try to connect. So what happens is that the way the brain works is that it scans. You know, if you look at birds, if you look at the head of a bird, you see the bird is like in it's like it, its head in a nanosecond just snaps to the left, stares, 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 snaps to the right, stares, 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 snaps to a diagonal angle, stares, stares. Do you see what I mean? It's like scanning, right? So we can say brains are scanners <laughs> for the soul, you know. <laughs> Uh, so these 10 people in this room, what's going to happen? There's going to be, based on the type of world they see, allegiances, right? That means the drops of rain are going to mesh, right? But eventually after they mesh, a history is going to develop. And then after the short-term psychological display, there comes the, as I was saying, simpler moments lead to more complex moments, you know?
That means in simple moments prepare for the complex and complex moments prepare for the simple. Because as, as the will of nature goes forth, eventually the other side of the coin will be seen. These 10 people, their psychologies are going to also not be based on who they were, but also how they express themselves in the moment of existence to be. So then after there is a sort of general definite, like, like, okay, that person's like that, this person's like that. After that, there, there comes a behavioral uh, creation. It's as if it's not it's important who you were. It's also who you are now, which means like how you're piloting this novel will to uh, uh, that has reemerged re in <clears throat> uh, material patterns. You know. Imagine this is a hypothetical, playful thing. In, um, in uh, Vedic thought, at least in the Mahabharata, uh, gods, higher gods in, in supposed higher dimensions, would come down and speak to wise sages. <clears throat> Rishi Vyasa was an example. So imagine a hypothetical setting where a god has asked a question from the person and they've given an answer that's helped that god. Now the person is asking, the human is asking that god a question. If you are here, who am I? If I am here, who are you? And let me tell you what the answer of that God would be. Laughter. Just giant laughter. You know, and that God would be like, you human beings think there's death. That's so adorable. You think there's life. You know, you haven't understood the secrets of force beyond shape. Because you see, we are, just think about it, right now we are treating the world as inanimate. We're treating it like space is an empty room where we can't see its edge and stuff's just hovering, floating, you know. <clears throat> that means there's nothing <laughs> normal and reasonable about our world. We're just floating in empty space. Knowledge is floating in the unknown. And where we have wars and violence and uh, ignorance. It's hilarious. <laughs> We're in empty space, but so much pain and suffering, you know. What if it's not an empty room? What if it is the unconscious of another conscious mind? That means we are a leaf, the universe is a branch. <clears throat> uh, our universe is a branch, uh, sorry, our universe is a leaf. And there are uh, other universes are like other leaves and the what is really holding these multiverses is the branch so the multiverse is the branch really. so imagine that who you are now is one infinite <laughs> you know of who you are that means even imagine right now you know who's speaking to you imagine not imagine like i'll tell you personally who i am now my voice my name my personality also inclusive with my memory my imagination 
and how the present is endlessly re recreating like the present moment is ev it, the pre present moment gets to see uh, both sides gets to see endless creation it's like sand it, the present moment is a portal between a dimension of endless creation and a dimension of endless destruction I'm telling you we are in Vishnu's dream That means it's as if, uh, imagine some people waking up people in the morning who are sleeping in late, and imagine late to work, and imagine some people shouting at the sky, trying to wake up a god from its own dream. The voice of what we are, it is just endless laughter. Do you know, and not a laughter like how there's a diabolical guy kind of petting a cat laughter, do you know, <laughs> you know, the laughter that is free, a freedom before the idea of freedom, what would that be? We start as really just a part of the world moving and then we're named and we personalize and we become a person in the world and then when we're in the world we live a whole life where we're like yeah i'm in this i'm gonna keep going that's my mission and then suddenly at the at some point we're gonna go back to just being nature's movement so unless man has the ability it's as if think of it this way before our psychologies can can uh, can uh, make contact with let's say poetically the future extraterrestrial <clears throat> it would be something where we require to make contact with the presence of nature and we might be surprised of how many bodies our eyes are actually looking through and it's not our eyes you know there was an episode in rick and morty this show which was epic there was just one scene where rick is like trying to find his real self so he's constantly waking up in different parallel versions parallel lives of himself right and then every time he notices it he quickly gets rid of himself you know or does something like that right now he enters a parallel version of himself where he starts forgetting who, what the real rick beyond this life was doing do you know? So then he feels it's all real, but then there's a moment, it's just genius how the writers did this. There's a moment where Rick is catching on to the other life. And those moments are really what the miss the only moments where the silence of the mystic will come get, shout an instruction. It's like imagine you paid for like some next level, like back in the day level kind of opera, you know, and you've gone in and you've sat in the seat and you have earmuffs on, right? And since you were born into the moment you entered that opera house, you had earmuffs. <laughs> The idea that the Logos shared to my inner realms, that God enters the body, it, that idea, of course, can be translated, interpreted in multiple ways. I could see like five ways of translating that. But I'll, but, but I'll tell you the way I'm saying it is like, When you're done living as a self, you live as the world. When you're li done living as the world, you become the unknown mover. When you're done living as the unknown mover, you remember your real life. Yeah. So those who can somehow in this life trust the unknown and move and navigate, and this is how you can tell. 
You know, nobody is, uh, there's no such thing as a measurement of intelligence because we, if we were clones, we could have an IQ test. You know, <laughs> you know, we could measure the same kind of, uh, you know, same kind of D, like DNA, right? But because we're different, intelligence is only a tool. There's no such thing as stupid or smart people. There's just people who realize they can use something, what they have. That's it. That's all that it has been. We are being something while we're doing something. And the way we're doing something is not allowing us to notice how we're being something. Now, if we realize we're being something that is way beyond how we're doing things, then how we're doing things has endless dimensions to grow. In the same way that I, I want people um, to really look at this, that on the planet there's 8 billion human beings. This is a strange condition, you know. 8 billion human beings um, are, means 8 billion unknown variables. It's scary, okay. It means that we're 8 billion people on a boat in, the, in unknown waters and we have no idea if these people are going to suddenly start breaking the boat, if these people are going to actually help build uh, a kind of sky city while we're on the boat, you know, on the sinking boat. Like there, there has to be strategy. The, the honest heart cannot lie to itself so it will in some sense go forth into the unknown. There's nothing left. You see, you ask for the allegiance in the known realms. If nothing comes, then you ask for allegiance in the unknown. If nothing comes, you enter the unknown. Lions can roar, yet none of the roars are the same. <clears throat> Sight is a double edged sword where the consciousness activates between the inner and the outer world, the subjective realms and the objective realms. And we can say that attachment to the identity could be a, a hilarious light dash fetish. <laughs> we are obsessed with our, our light. <laughs> you know? Oh, man. It's like the heart is the universe, the mind is a planetary creature, the mind is the planet. So this is why one cannot be the mind. That means we have to even have a discrimin discrimination, there's different types of logos. <clears throat> there isn't one kind of logos, that means to, to the common mind it may appear. You know, we're like, how can non-duality have a classification? Well, <laughs> but It's like beyond our eyes, we are freedom's central sun. Freedom's central sunrise. We get rid of fear of the outer realms by building a healthy world where everybody has enough. Then the minds can begin properly working. In the inner realms, 
a question somehow has to be found from within the person, an ultimate question of their life. Because the greatest explorers are not even scared of peeling off the sky. <clears throat> Beyond the veils of mystery. We cannot be what we are, or we have not gone into the beyond. So I would say the loving embrace of change is the best way to wield any weapon manifest. And when I say weapon, I mean any tool, like how, how the psyche projects uh, Thought, uh, what we consider thought. And here's the bigger question. How can a thought know it's a thought? You know, that's how hollow the word thought is. <laughs> Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. I hope this episode was helpful. Perhaps beyond the body, life moves in ways where even the eternal can learn from. You know, I, I before I end off, actually, I'm going to share this idea. I thought about uh, ideological institutions, whether religious, non-religious, any anything that... <clears throat> has a sort of dogmatic agenda, right? I felt that they're going to turn into the Hunger Games uh, in the future. That means either the either the organization, institution, whatever it is, it chooses to walk with the world or it goes on its own walk and in the future there's going to be the Hunger Games. I thought about what's going to happen <clears throat> on a planet where a bunch of... Um, uh, wild ideologies are like a group of dogs fighting. Right. I thought about that if the game is going to happen, if the Hunger Games is going to happen, we have so much time to at least prepare for that moment. Right. So I thought of maybe having this view, call it beyondism, the only ideology, you know, or unknownism, these two words, these two words are going to last out. Because their their implication is is of a universal significance, they will uh, live till the test of time. That means anybody who wondered about the beyond, anybody who was born now who wonders about the beyond, even the future is going to wonder about the beyond, right? That's one thing I know that whether I, uh, I have children or not, it, it's going to be something that it's going to be common with the future generations. You know, that, that means I have nothing in common with them. I wouldn't be existing thousands of years from now. But the way we stare at the unknown is like staring at the moon, you know? It's like people don't just uh, from different parts of the world stare at the moon. They also stare at that giant unknown space behind it as well, you know? We have always been, you cannot stare at the moon alone. The moon has never been alone. <clears throat> so beyondism or unknownism is going to be like a backup system algorithm. So imagine religious institutions, imagine even other types of, you know, cultural, political, social institutions all fought, fighting, battling and how to live on. It's not just people who want to survive. It's also collective uh, beings, which you can say groups of people are like collective beings when they all follow one ideology. Right. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it's as if it's like th these these forces are battling it out. 
but I notice that these forces are battling it out through the impression of being a temporary human being first that has to respond to the world, right? So eventually when we become immortal and these ideological systems are around, right? Imagine immortal beings fighting over truth till the end of time. People fighting over like how long? Imagine if we were immortal people, let's say uh, back in the day in the 6th century, all, all you know, or whatnot, like where they all fought and there were religious wars and whatnot right <clears throat> even the crusades beyond that so it's as if imagine none of those people could die they were all immortal and all of them would be around now right do you think right now we would be fighting over religion no those people would be like it's pointless for how long are we going to just stab each other with swords as immortals do you know so it's that eventually after some point, we will look at the ideology, we will look at the thought and we'll wonder, even if the person is, uh, you see, <clears throat> uh, it's this strange thing that I would say, even in the religious lens, it's as if God's creation is perfect, yet people feel they have to do something on this planet in the name of God. It's, it's mind blowing. It's as if, what, did God make a mistake or not? Do you know? If God is perfect, why do you need the message? You know, or let's say even if it's a message, why do you need to worship the message? Why not receive the message and continue on? Do you know, when a person gets, for example, a message uh, on the on uh, any device they have, they read the message and they're done. They see what it meant. They see the inner realms of it and they move past it. But to keep seeing, imagine your whole time you made the that message the screensaver of your phone, right? That one, imagine you got a text message and you made that text message a screensaver of your phone and every moment you were going but you were still seeing the same message, you know? So it, it is this thing that even from theologians have, have this uh, uh, even argued about this, you know? That uh, if God's will, if God, people in, in religious communities, they say terms like God's, God's will or God willing or what not right so it's as if 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 it's all god moving what does man have to do how can man fight over imperfection how could the other be wrong because you either see people as god's creation or not do you know so for me the fact that it was as if god's creation interpreted a message and then had to go do something makes no sense from the beginning god's creation was perfect if you are choosing to be religious if God's creation is perfect, man's interference is unnecessary. Ideological systems are wild. It's like you person walks into a forest and sees two animals fighting and you're like, okay, I can't break up that fight. Maybe you throw a stick to distract like one of the, uh, I don't know. that, but, <laughs> but like it becomes like, um, <sighs> the unknown. You know, it's like, think of all ideological systems that are trying to define themselves with known shape and design and with a specific form or a specific world story. They are running in a marathon. At the end of the marathon line, that's where unknownism is standing. That means that's how the backup system is going to be. All ideological systems have to realize Either the unknown is here first, then the known. So we got to relax on knowledge a little bit. And when I say knowledge, I mean like uh, ideological worship, you know, <laughs> you know, language worship, you know, because it, it's like when a person thinks about knowledge, it's like, why do I need to know this? Well, it's the expressionism of the human being that's it, it's relevant to, you know. It's remarkable. Life opens our eyes nature and nature also closes our eyes and it is only this middle gap in between in vishnu's vicinity as if brahma 
pushed us and gave us through us to Vishnu, and Vishnu is at some point going to give us to Shiva. Do you know? <clears throat> the archetype of the creative force passed it down to the maintaining force. The archetype of the maintaining force passed it down to the destructive force. And guess who the destructive is going to pass it to? <clears throat> Genius, genius um, can, should be defined as the gift of novelty to those who have been able to see the unknown. And it's a walk. It's, it's a very strange walk. Eight billion creatures. Like, what are we doing here? And one explanation is that we have to be surveillance. I feel we are surveillance devices. What I mean by that is that <clears throat> um, I used this metaphor in uh, the previous talk I gave, um, where imagine a square town. Um, <clears throat> and in square town, there's um, square beings living, two-dimensional like creatures, squares living, right? Now, one of these squares is like, what is the meaning of all these squares on this two-dimensional world? Like, what is the point of being a square in a square town, you know, in a square world? <clears throat> and so this square, imagine it goes out away from the other squares goes into uh, the nature that embraces the shaman's uh, audacity and this square looks around and it's like okay the whole cosmos is a square as above so below you know so i can imagine that you know above me there's it's like all squares too you know it's like wow the universe is made of squares i have endless parallel square selves you know but this square will suddenly at some point realize it's actually a three-dimensional cube imagine you put a cube on a table and the surface of the table was square town you know all the all the squares would be like yo where did the square come from you know so <clears throat> that cube is the realization of the human position and the story of the human being is like square town language is like square town you know <laughs> but the mysteries of the soul are cubic and beyond Language wars, the language, the ideological hunger games, supposedly that the way we look at it now, it may happen in the future. Those, it, it's like for how long can immortal animals fight each other? After some point, something has to change. And I feel it's like, what did the species get for Christmas? <laughs> Awakening beyond the linguistic simulation game, right? <laughs> it's like the greatest Christmas gift of them all. I realized Santa wasn't real. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like, uh, language has gone out of control. <laughs> I feel if we really saw the world as it was, we will get frightened of how chaotic we're living as human beings, regardless of our uh, consideration of civility. Regardless of how much we feel, yeah, civilization's progress, are you kidding me? You know, I'll tell you, it's as if, like, um, we stepped out of the 
actual jungle into the concrete jungle but our minds have not fully stepped out of nature this <clears throat> nature's jungle that the, our minds haven't stepped out of the actual jungle and so when they truly come to civilization it means a new space of mind this is really the true essence of alchemy you know people feel in alchemy it's only a substantial relationship it's only like it's 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 kind of like a mixing visible phenomena but there's an alchemy with space and i don't know how many people know that many people pray for what's uh, stuff in space i don't know how many people pray for for their space <laughs> you know so what i mean by that is that it, it's it's like after some point your your attention animates the meaning of the outer realm so how you hold your attention becomes the ultimate how you are being attention anybody um opens that door then you your inner realms uh, will speak louder than any outer realm was anyways thanks for listening and uh Use your sight well while you can. Blessings.